The ancient Olympic Games began, as far as we can tell, in 776 BC. It was held every four years in Olympia, Greece, as a way to celebrate and worship the Greek god Zeus. It went on like this for roughly a thousand years. Fast forward to 1896, the Olympic Games were resurrected and this time began to include athletes from every nation and to celebrate sportsmanship, athleticism, and a healthy competition. Today, August 5th, 2016, marks the opening ceremony of the 31st Olympiad in Rio de Janeiro. The Olympics, however, are more than just games. They're political icebreakers, helping to reach across borders of race, religion, cultural hatred, the borders of countries, and gender. The second Olympic Games in France in 1900 were also the first games which allowed women to participate. Of 997 athletes, 22 were women, in a time where the majority of the first world countries wouldn't have had a suffrage movement for another two decades. In the 1936 Berlin Olympics, an American named Jesse Owens helped unite his country behind him regardless of his race, even though it'd still be nearly three decades until Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. There have been huge moments in sports history, not just things that have sparked historical, national, or cultural movements, but also little tidbits where the endearing spirit of the human spark has shown a particular athlete in his or her finest moments. Some of these moments are obvious. Gold winners like Jesse Owens, Larissa Latinia, a gymnast who was the most decorated Olympian between 1964 and 1972, and Michael Phelps, the swimmer who currently holds the record for most decorated Olympian of all time. But there are other moments. Moments that when you watch them or rewatch them, it shows you something. They tell you the story of the indomitable human spirit. From the 1988 Winter Olympics Jamaican bobsled team, which inspired the movie Cool Runnings, to the awesome performance of athletes like the snowboarder Sean White or Mary Lou Retton, who was the first gymnast from the U.S. to win a gold medal. And then there's the Canadian figure skater, Joni Rochette, who won the bronze medal for her heartwarming routine performed only four days after her mother passed away. Then there's the stories that will make you cringe or tip your hat in pride at their determination. The British runner, Derek Redman, who tore his hamstring halfway through a semi-final race, but still refused to give up and rose to finish the race despite intense pain. The 2004 Puerto Rican basketball team that dethroned the USA's three-time championship team. And what about Carrie Strug, the young woman from the 1996 Summer Olympics who performed a huge gymnastics vault and double somersault and landed it perfectly on a busted ankle. She was so badly injured afterwards she had to be carried off the mat and subsequently carried to the podium to be with her team to accept the medal. It's stories like these that bring us back to the games time and time again to see who will go next and who will rise to the top despite adversity and overwhelming odds. But like I said before, the Olympic Games have also been a great unifier. As the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, strives to spread gender and racial equality, it's come under some criticism for this as well as praise. The critics believe that the IOC is spreading their own views and forcing others to conform to them as well as forcing cities to pay an exorbitant amount of money to host the games, while still claiming to be a non-profit. However, there have also been many good things that have come from the bureaucratic IOC being in charge. Before 2012, not every one of the 200-plus competing countries had had women competitors. The 2012 Summer Olympics in London was the first time we saw at least one female representative from every country participating in the games, with the countries of Brunei, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia being the last to finally include at least one female athlete. For Brunei and Qatar, it had just been a matter of size as both countries didn't have more than a handful of athletes going as it was. There was just no funding or reason for them to really send a female athlete. In order for them to comply, the IOC did allow the Brunei athlete, Mazaya Mahusin, into the Olympic events, even though she didn't meet the qualifier for her event. She came in with 61 seconds, not even coming close to the qualifying 51.55 seconds 
she needed to beat. But she was allowed to participate anyways to promote the IOC's concept of universality, which gives the National Olympic Committee's, quote, the possibility of entering unqualified athletes in athletics and swimming should they not have athletes qualified in these sports, end quote. And while all of these athletes have had to beat out some national challenges or something to get to where they are, it might leave a sour taste in the mouths of some of the competitors who fought tooth and nail to participate in the Olympics for their nation, but lost because of a difference of half a second. But may be flabbergasted to see a competitor from another nation being allowed in who performed worse than they did, simply because that nation doesn't have anyone else to participate. Some may argue, should they even participate in that event then? But then again, the real reason the tiny countries of Qatar and Brunei were forced to bring a female competitor was to strong-arm Saudi Arabia, whose government physically would not allow women to compete. Saudi Arabia was threatened with removal from future Olympic Games by the IOC if they did not allow women to compete, something that the IOC has done in the past for much smaller reasons. Of course, no country is forced to participate. They have, there have been several times which countries have boycotted going to another country's games. During, during the Cold War, there was the 1980 Olympics in Moscow, which were boycotted by the USA and several other NATO countries. And then in 1984, the Soviet bloc boycotted the Olympics held in L.A. Australia, Great Britain, Greece, Switzerland, and France have the distinction of being the only five countries to have participated in all 27 Summer Olympics so far. And they'll be continuing the tradition this year in Rio de Janeiro. With the increasing political tension between countries, religions, and ruling ideologies, it's good to see what could be called a healthy competition bring these nations together. But the question remains, is it true and healthy competition? And are the games for the best? The last four Olympic Games in Beijing, Vancouver, London, and Sochi cost upwards to 44, 1.7, 10.4, and 51 billion US dollars respectively, with the taxpayers picking up the bill for a lot of it. So this obviously poses the question as to where all that money goes and if there is a more effective way to host the games than the IOC. But despite how we feel about the IOC and its management, whether we think they're fighters for the little guy or we think they're corrupt jerks who use the power of their offices to accept bribes and overlook possible cheating, it's hard to ignore the facts. And the fact is that the games have encouraged and inspired many people from all over the world. And all we can hope is that it will keep doing so. So what do you think? Are the Olympic Games fine the way they are? Could they be better? Should we just remove the games altogether because healthy competition is how people get their feelings hurt? I certainly have my opinion, but I'd like to hear yours. And while this is the last episode of this season, i definitely like to hear your opinions and suggestions for topics for the next season of The Plot Hole Show. Don't forget to hit that like button if you like what you're seeing, and give me a subscribe if you'd like to show the show some support. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next season.